intrigued with his title because I happen to love fishing as a sport. And I was thinking, well, Colorado, I suspect, has some pretty good, at least trout fishing, right? Uh, but it's not about that at all. Uh, the second thought I want to share with you is that when I, about 50 years ago, when I, I was serving on NIH study section for the first time, it was a basic science study section. And frankly, the worst thing we could say about somebody's research proposal was that it was a fishing expedition. This really was the ultimate in criticism. But that's basic science. And in the last uh, 10 years, as I've become much more involved in clinical trials, it's really quite the opposite, because I'm sure most of you know any single center clinical trial is almost meaningless in its ability to be generalized to multi-center results. So the need for sharing data among uh, diverse, at least uh, geographic locations, is tremendous. So with that, we'll hear from Casey. You have, you're wired up, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, I think the idea that fishing expeditions are uh, somewhat undesirable in science is, is uh, a little bit widespread. So for the next, you know, half hour or so, we can hang this on our door. And I'm going to talk about fishing expeditions in a positive way. So I'm going to try to rescue this concept from the idea that even in basic science, it's not something we should do. And actually, last year at the Gold Lab Symposium, uh, Tom Blumenthal said much the same thing. You know, the worst thing that can be said about your grant is that it's a fishing expedition. So I, wanna, I want you to keep that in your mind as we go through this, because you know, he has a follow-up statement for that that I'll reveal at the end. Some of you who are here may remember it. Uh, and I think you know, it, it's important to remember that the types of work that, that involve you know, discovery where we're actually going out into the unknown are the types of work that are the hardest things to pursue sometimes. So when I started my lab five years ago, what I really wanted to do was to build systems that could let us understand how biological systems work directly from data. So you'd imagine we'd collect a bunch of data and then we'd, we'd mine those data in some way to figure out you know, how a cell uh, persists or how a cell um, survives or, or how organisms or communities of organisms uh, live and survive. And so you could imagine that the way you might want to do this is to survey thousands of biologists, basically every expert in the field, and see what they thought the best experiment to do right now would be. Uh, perform those experiments, process the data, and somehow kind of mine this information out of it. And you can imagine uh, this is like one of the ultimate fishing expeditions, right? The type of thing you, you really couldn't do, because I have no idea in advance what experiments I would even propose. Uh, and so, you know, I've not written a grant asking for a couple billion dollars to do this experiment, uh, but I, I can kind of imagine where that grant would go. However, I do have an internet connection, and one of the really wonderful things about working in a field like I work in, so I work in genomics, is that there's this culture of sharing. And what this means is over the past 15 years, people who have done an experiment have generally uploaded the results of that experiment to a public server. So if I am Lego Grace Hopper, and I have an internet connection, I might not be able to collect $2 billion of data myself, but I can download it simply by going online and accessing these public repositories of data. And so this is really what my lab has tried to do, is to make sense of, of this massive resource of data. I do want to say that most people aren't using these data, largely because they're considered difficult to analyze. And I don't want this to come across as a criticism of kind of the scientific process. So I don't want to say, you know, oh, scientists are wasteful. They've generated all this data they haven't used. You know, just kind of let, let's chat. I won't go into politics, but I will say uh, that if you think about how much this $2 billion resource is in terms of dollars and cents terms, this is essentially all the data that we've generated and shared over the past 15 years. It's this little yellow square. If you think about what the, the US spent on defense last, this last fiscal year, it's these 310, uh, 305 yellow squares. So I just want to say, you know, a lot of the, the studies that you're hearing about that would be audacious and potentially considered expensive you know, they're expensive on the scale that we do science, but they're not necessarily expensive on the scale that, that our society operates on. Okay, we'll leave, that will be the last foray into, into politics and, and spending. So, okay, so we have this potential data set that we could use. Um, how do we actually make this valuable? So how do we make it not something that we can download, but actually something that tells us about biology? For that, we're gonna need to develop new algorithms. But if we could develop these algorithms, I think there's a, a distinct opportunity they could change the world. I love this quote from Andy Grove, who was a CEO of Intel. He said, a strategic inflection point is a time in the life of a business when its fundamentals are about to change. 
And these data could represent that for how we do kind of biological science. And I, I would really like the follow on it if you skip a few paragraphs. He says, they build up force so insidiously that you may have a hard time even putting a finger on what has changed, yet you know that something has. And so the goal of my lab is to put these data together in a way and share them so that anyone can, can take advantage of this resource. And we hope that this will induce a strategic inflection point where the fishing expedition is no longer a pejorative thing that we don't fund, but in fact a routine part of what we do every day. So the challenge with this is actually putting these data together in a meaningful way is something that we shouldn't be able to do. So I'm a computational biologist. I was trained in genetics. I was trained in statistics. You know, this is a system that should not work, right? We have all these data generated in many different labs. They're whatever people happen to upload, and they really didn't give us any detailed information about any of them. And so this is the type of data that we're, we're sort of taught as scientists is just not useful. Uh, fortunately, I have a lab, and people in my lab uh, have a different background than I do. So I had a student who joined the lab who didn't know that this was an impossible question, <laughs> or is very optimistic. And so uh, Jia Tan joined my lab uh, about four and a half years ago. Uh, and so what I'm going to tell you is sort of the story of her work solving this question that you know all my training told me we shouldn't be able to solve. Uh, the, the approach that she took is actually one that, that sort of mirrors how um, brains work. So I'm gonna, we're going to do a test here. We're going to see if you can implement this algorithm. OK, I blocked out something on this image. At least <laughs> one of you needs to guess what I blocked out. <laughs> OK, so I'm hearing the word it was blocked out. So it's something about this image you recognize, right? You've seen it before. It's a recurrent pattern. You understand, uh, in some way, what's missing here. And so you could imagine that maybe what happens is that in your brain, this is going to be a vast simplification of neuroscience. <laughs> You've got this sort of pattern recognition uh, detector. And so maybe, you know, we'll put this down at the bottom. This is the original image. And so you've got, let's say, some neuron somewhere in your brain uh, that, that's capable of recognizing this image. And so basically here, the just and the, the do are recognized. However, you know, there's not much coming from where we've blocked out. This is something that's missing to you. And you can imagine maybe what your brain kind of does is, is run this in reverse and say, OK, I'm going to say, well, this, this neuron was active. I'm going to run it backwards. I'm going to say, OK, this is actually what the original image was. You know, this is a kind of vast oversimplification of how our brain works. But it's actually not a vast oversimplification of the types of machine learning algorithms that we're using here. And so the machine learning algorithms are all predicated on this really simple idea that if you take data, you add random noise to that data, and then you train a neural network to give you the original data back, it can reveal these recurrent patterns that we already have seen over and over again. And so this is not just something that we do. So this is a paper that, that Google published in 2012 where they showed 10 million uh, images from YouTube videos to 16,000 computers. Does anyone want to guess what one of these neurons might recognize? Cats. Cats. So I'm guessing you've either seen this before or you've watched a lot of funny online videos. <laughs> so this is actually one of the neurons from their paper. And uh, if you look at what that neuron's recognizing, you know, it's not you know, your, your standard house cat, but you can really see the pattern of a cat in this image. And so this is you know, sort of like your, 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 when you see just do, and then you can infer it. This is the, the type of structure that allows the computer to infer, well, even if the image has an ear blocked out here, it's probably a cat. So we're going to do this, but we're not going to do it for images. We're going to do it for a data that we call gene expression data, and many people call gene expression data. So if you imagine here, the genome is this linear chromosome. So you have a genome, and it's made up of A's, C's, T's, and G's. Uh, with, embedded within those A's, C's, T's, and G's in various places are genes. So in this case, I've got a gene 1 and a, and a gene 2. Uh, what we're talking about at this point is not which genes are necessarily present in the genome. We're talking about how active they are. So, so to act, each of these genes end up, ends up expressed into some form. And so we can look at that at many different levels. We're going to look at it at a level called uh, messenger RNA. And so you could imagine that maybe there's a lot of, a lot of gene 2 and a small amount of gene 1. Uh, just in the interest of simplicity, instead of putting the numbers up here, I'll just color code them. So I'm sorry if anyone's red, green, colorblind. I suspect that in a room of this size, a number of you are. Uh, I promise red and green will play a very small role at just this introduction. But we use the canonical color green for a gene that's expressed at a low level, like gene 1, or red for a gene that's expressed at a high level, like gene 2. 
And we're gonna do the, the same thing that we did uh, with the, the Nike logo, and we're gonna do the same thing that Google did with the, the YouTube videos, where we're gonna take these gene expression values, so we're gonna look at every gene in an organism, which here is this row, and we're gonna, we're gonna know its gene expression because someone measured it. And then we're gonna block out certain genes that we just choose randomly, and then we're gonna train a neural network to identify recurrent patterns in that. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna put these genes into the, the, this corrupted data into the neural network, and we're gonna train it to give us the original data back. So this is just like the sort of neuron example, where we're putting an input into the system and we're training the, the computer to give us the full uh, story back. And so in this case, uh, we're gonna represent uh, nodes that are off in blue, so the one on the left has a lot of low genes feeding into it, so it's off, and the one on the right has a lot of high genes feeding into it, so it's gonna be yellow, it's on. You can think of it maybe like a light bulb. And we're gonna apply this to a complete collection of gene expression data. So we didn't start with the full set of two million samples, because what we wanted was something we could train a computer to look at on a laptop. So like your laptop could analyze this data. And uh, what we settled on is this uh, compendium for this organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, it's a microbe that causes uh, infections, generally in immunocompromised people, often individuals with cystic fibrosis that are difficult or impossible to treat. It'll cause recurrent exacerbations. And the reason we picked this is because this data set has a lot of the complexities that we expect to see in the full, the full set, but we can tackle it on a laptop. And so, in this case, it's made up of more than 100 different experiments. The actual median sample size in this case is six, so most labs have run an experiment that includes just six samples, and we're, we're basically gonna put that together. Uh, the, the total number of uh, experiment of samples in the compendium is about 1,500. So this is about a million dollars worth of data if you want to imagine kind of the $2 billion C. And what we wanted to do is just ask, can this neural network extract these recurrent patterns? So it can it extract the cats in the data that we would expect to be there first. And so one of these things we expected to, to see is this transcription factor called ANR. ANR is the anaerobic response machinery, so when these cells are at a low oxygen level, they need to respond to that by changing um, how they behave, and, and one of the things they do is um, they basically will, will stop swimming around and they'll sort of settle on a surface and form biofilms. And that's mediated by this transcription factor ANR. And so we built this model and we looked for a node that, that captured this anaerobic response machinery, and what we found was one node uh, that, that really seemed to capture it very cleanly. And then what we wanted to know is not just is this descriptive of the data that we have, but does this model actually work in a system that we've never, uh, the, uh, work in an experiment that's never been done before. And so we teamed up with uh, Deb Hogan's lab at Dartmouth to, to put this model to the test. And Jack Hammond is the graduate student in her lab who, who did this analysis. And all we're doing is we're gonna duplicate the, the situation um, that, that was on the previous slide. We have a monolayer of airway epithelial cells that are from, uh, that have the genotype of the cystic fibrosis, uh, that have a loss of function in the cystic fibrosis gene. So this is an environment where Pseudomonas will settle down, it'll form microcolonies, uh, and, and these biofilms. And actually the, uh, the image on the left is actually what this looks like if you don't want the, the schematic form of it. And what we did is we actually knocked out ANR. So we know that in this environment ANR should be active, uh, and then we just remove the gene ANR from the system. And so we can say, does this actually work? Does, the signaling, does this, this signature turn on when we put them into this anaerobic environment, and can we make that go away by turning off ANR? And we did a quick microarray experiment just to test this, so we measured the gene expression levels of all genes in the microbe, and, and then fed it into this neural network model, and just like the cat image, where if you put in a cat video, you know, the cat neuron lights up, here the, the neuron that we associated with the ANR signal lights up. And, uh, we, we thought this was pretty fun. Uh, we ended up submitting it for publication, and uh, the reviewers of the paper basically said, well, this is nice, but, but microarrays are the technology of a decade ago, so let, let's update to some modern technology, um, even though it kind of measures exactly the same thing. So uh, <laughs> despite that, we decided to keep our reviewers happy, so we did the same experiment uh, using uh, RNA-seq, which is the modern technology to do exactly the same thing, and <laughs> What we saw was exactly the same result, so that's always nice. Um, <laughs> and so we see this in the canonical lab strain, PAO1, 
One of the nice things about moving to RNA sequencing is we no longer had to deal with hybridization issues. So you could imagine that if a microbe has a different sequence, its genes may not um, show up the same way on a microarray. So we, we're actually able to look now at a new strain. So this is a strain isolated from the clinic, J215. Um, and in this strain, we also see the same thing. So not only does this model generalize to an experiment that's never been done before, it also generalizes to a strain of this microbe that's never been seen before by this neural network. So this was really exciting to us. So uh, we did the things that scientists do. We published a paper. Um, and I just want to emphasize that the paper, one of the things that we do is we actually put up preprints of our paper. So if you want to see what we're up to before it's been peer reviewed, uh, you can take a look at the preprints of the paper. So this we put up on a server called BioArchive. We make our source code publicly available so that anyone who wants to um, take the data that we generated or take the systems that we built and reuse them can do so. We pick a license that allows them to be used either commercially or non-commercially. So this way, anyone can basically take it and do whatever you want with it. Because we think this is sort of our mission as academic scientists is to build tools that, that, that change the way that people do science, whether they're in academia or in industry. And, um, and so I just want to thank the authors on this paper. So Jia Tan, uh, who uh, this picture you saw before, is the computational biologist. Jack Hammond did the molecular work. Um, and Deb Hogan is our molecular collaborator who, um, whose lab uh, J Jack worked in. So, so we were really happy with this. We had done you know, the thing that a scientist does, which is publish a paper and share it with the world. Um, so, so in that sense, we were sort of succeeding. But you know, if we think about our, our fundamental goal that we started with is we want to go fishing. And we went fishing, but we kind of went fishing in a pond like this. And so I know this is a little bit hard to read, uh, but I'm from Georgia. And this is a picture of a pond in Georgia. And I just want to highlight it. It says, free rods and reels, uh, no license required. Free bait, no limit, no catch, no pay. And so you know this pond is loaded with fish. And it's probably loaded with the same kinds of fish. And this is what looking for ANR is like. We knew ANR existed, right? So we're basically fishing in the stocked pond. What we really wanted to do when we set out to do this is to actually identify fish that we might not have expected in a certain place. So we sort of wanted to look at what's out there and really kind of see it in its more natural environment. And so to do that, what we had to do was, was change our system so that it could actually look across experiments, not just within experiments. I'm going to skip the technical details of how we do this, but essentially what we do is we end up, instead of training one neural network, we train hundreds of neural networks. And then we identify the consistent signatures across all those neural networks. And uh, we think that maybe this is more important to do in biology than other fields like cat detection. Because when you're looking for cats in, in images, you, know, you don't really care how that model works. You just care that it can find you the next funny cat video. But we actually care how the model works. So we want to know how these systems work. So we think that might be a reason um, that, that we've sort of had to take this approach where other people haven't, haven't needed to do this. OK, so I want to tell you something we found kind of going at the problem this way. So this is sort of the Julia Child version of this, where I'm going to sort of pull the, the done uh, cake out of the oven. So there's a, a, we, we ran an analysis to identify the signatures that, that we thought we could get a handle on. So these are things that are on sometimes across all Pseudomonas data, but off a few times. Uh, sorry, or, or vice versa, on a few times and off all other times. And when we did that, one of the key signatures that came out is phosphate starvation. So if Pseudomonas, phosphate's an essential nutrient. So if Pseudomonas is in low phosphate, uh, this uh, gene called FOR, uh, will, the protein FOR will activate a transcription factor called FOB, which is this blue arrow. And that will turn on lots of things. It actually turns out to be very convenient. It turns on an alkaline phosphatase that will make media containing BSIP turn blue so we can actually see when this pathway is active. And if we do that, uh, the, the sort of canonical way that this system works is, is shown here. So if I have wild type Pseudomonas or I knock out a couple other genes, the phosphate starvation pathway is active. If on the other hand I knock out either FOR or FOB, so these cases, the phosphate starvation pathway is inactive. Basically it's not blue. What we found when we looked across the entire compendium in conditions where we were supposed to be seeing phosphate starvation is that this is not how the system works all the time. So this is you know, sort of how a, a textbook would tell you this system works. But there's no way in this system to make this result. So this is a media called peptone. And um, in this case, here's wild type. Here's the other controls. So these are all doing just what you expect. But this system, if you knock out FOR, so this is removing FOR, uh, this process is still on. So we should never see this with our current understanding of biology. 
And this is not uncommon. So when we actually looked at, at media across the compendium where we thought we were going to see uh, a phosphate starvation response, uh, many of them actually behave, this is the peptone slide from before, but we see the same thing in PIA, King's media, and so actually the thing that we thought was the special case actually looks like across the compendium is actually what, what occurs more often than kind of the thing we were supposed to find. And we think some of this happens because if you go to very high levels of phosphate and very low levels of phosphate, these are the types of experiments that as scientists we're trained to, to do, basically. We, we want to perturb something a lot to see what changes. The pathway works just like you expect. So these are the, this is a very high level of phosphate. The pathway is off. At a low level of phosphate, it works perfectly. So it's really just these other media which weren't designed to probe this process where the system works differently. So that means you know, maybe this is a, a, a way to actually get at biology that's not discoverable any other way. And one of the things we were really excited to find is that if we look across the compendium, there's some cases we really can't explain, even with our model. And one of those is this situation. So this is a media called PIA. And there are six samples for PIA uh, that look like phosphate is uh, totally, there's present in the media, you know, they're not starved for phosphate. There are six other samples where it looks like they're really starved for phosphate. And what we asked is, what's different between these two cases? And it's worth noting these are two totally separate experiments. So this is not, again, not the way that you would normally do science, looking across different experiments that sort of don't have controls with each other. But if our model is robust enough, it should actually work in this case. And one of the things that we noticed is that these ones were, that don't have this phosphate starvation response also lack this gene kind B. And so we just asked a simple question, does kind B modulate this response in any way? Uh, and actually, so this is an assay to see if that happens. So this is again turning blue as the uh, phosphate starvation response goes on. And one of the things that you can notice is that actually in this kind of intermediate phosphate concentration, the kind B column looks different than the wild type. And so you know, in, in this case, it really looks like, you know, yes, kind B is involved in this process, and it's actually involved at kind of these intermediate phosphate concentrations, which would mirror what we saw before, that the process is different in this kind of intermediate range. And so this was really exciting to us, and it means that we can kind of go back to this pathway now that we've analyzed all these data and say, well, we don't know exactly how this works, but we know that sort of kind B is potentially an alternative input to this process. And the other thing we wanted to do was to make sure, you know, this wasn't something that, that's just generically true, that any sort of gene like this uh, will, will induce the same response. So we ended up knocking out every, uh, kind B is a histidine kinase, so we knocked out every histidine kinase in the genome one by one, uh, and actually saw that this is actually specific to kind B. So not only has this answer been sitting out there in public data for anyone to find for the last four years, um, it actually looks like it's a highly specific mechanism into how this process works. And we don't think this is just sort of a one-off. So this is literally the first thing we looked at with this model. And so it's just when you look at these data sets in a new way, sort of new answers start to fall out of them. Uh, so we then have done the thing that people do with these, um, which is uh, we posted a preprint so you can see the work now if you want to. Uh, the source code is all online if you want to get access to it. Uh, so Jia Tan, again, is the first author on this work from a computational perspective. Um, Georgia Dewing is a co-first author who did uh, molecular biology as well as some computational analyses. And then I want to thank uh, the other authors on this paper. And so this work, I think, is a little bit more back to the spirit that we talked about at the beginning. So this is a case where um, we've taken a data set and we've really looked for something and we didn't know what we were going to find. We took the, the sort of first hit that came out of it and we dug into it and we found this really cool new mechanism. And you know, there's two explanations for this. One is that we got lucky, and the other is just that these answers are out there everywhere, and we just need to start looking for them. I really, uh, this is Ulber Sant Yergi, and um, I think he's an a, a interesting uh, scientist, and so he won a Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of um, vitamin C, but also you know, he was a member of the Hungarian resistance during World War II, so you know, clearly a scientist who also occasionally uh, considered politics. Um, but he also has this really wonderful quote. He has a lot of interesting thoughts on how we should do science and grant writing. And he has this really wonderful paper uh, from 1972 published in Science, which is called Apollo uh, Dionysians and Apollonians. And, and he says, applying for a grant begins with writing a project. The Apollonian clearly sees the future lines of his research and has no difficulty writing a clear project. Not so the Dionysian, who knows only the direction in which he wants to go out into the unknown. And so what we want to do is actually empower the sort of Dionysian that's underneath every, every scientist to say, 
you know, let's take these data and, and just go fishing. Let's look for the things that we didn't know we should be looking for because we hope this will really take their science in a new direction. So to do this, one of the things that we're doing now is we're actually building a system that will take all these public data, um, normalize them in, in ways that, um, so Jacqueline Taroni is a postdoc in the lab. She's developed some really nice ways to normalize across platforms uh, and also between platforms. And uh, Kurt Wheeler is a software en engineer in the lab and they're teaming up to build the system that will produce a matrix that's essentially all these data sets normalized and available to any researcher who wants to use them at no charge. Uh, and I think you know, one of the values of this matrix is that basically what it's gonna be is you know, one of these, it's sort of like a large cohort. I mean, yes, it's a large cohort of gene expression studies, so it's not you know, a cohort of people, but the methods that we learn in this space might be applicable to, to you know, some of the, the studies that we've heard about already. Okay, so I wanna switch gears just a little bit and talk about culture in science, because thus far, you know, I've been talking about my own research and, and how, we, um, how we approach a problem, but I think it's important not just to consider you know, my lab's work, but also how science happens. So I love this, this is a letter from Newton to Hook, and uh, it actually says here, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so this is actually how science works, right? We, we do something and then we release it and other people build upon it. And I think this is critical to recognize. Actually, we published um, the paper about Pseudomonas. And one of the things we did is we just put the data set out there to analyze. And within five months, someone else had downloaded it, used it for an analysis and submitted a paper. And so I think that's really exciting. Basically, you know, this is just layers building upon each other. This isn't necessarily sort of universally appreciated. You could imagine people reusing your work might make you a little uh, annoyed if you were really focused on credit. Uh, there was an article in January of last year in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dan Longo and Jeff Drazen, and one of the things that they highlight is that uh, there are certain people who do not appreciate this reuse. Uh, and so uh, I just want to spend a little time reading a little bit here. Um, these are people who might use another group's data for their own ends possibly stealing from the research productivity planned by the data gatherers, or even using the data to try to disprove what the original investigators had posited. There is concern among some frontline researchers that the system will be taken over by what some researchers have characterized as research parasites. Uh, and so, <laughs> this really bothered me because, <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, I'm not saying, you know, I think the, the um, the views that sort of come through here are very much around the culture of credit in science and focusing on credit as the end point and not the process of discovery. And, you know, as someone who, you know, spends a lot of time, you know, writing grants and, and sort of struggling and, you know, basically uh, science is always a process of sort of rejection. And uh, <laughs> many more rejections than, than uh, acceptances. And so, you know, one of the things that gets me through it is, is just sort of the love of what I do. And uh, to see sort of that being twisted into a sort of a culture that's solely based on credit really bothered me. And so, you know, I'm an untenured assistant professor, so I just kind of hang around unless they decide they want to keep me uh, at my institution. And so, uh, I have nothing in terms of power except a website. And fortunately, I use that website <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to announce these things that we called the Research Parasite Awards. And so we, we really wanted to sort of celebrate ways that people had reused data. And this was just, I mean, I, you know, there were a couple months of planning that went into it. Um, but basically, we just put a note up on my lab website that was like, we're doing this thing this year, submit a, you know, you know, an application and we'd love to consider it. Um, and we'll announce the winners in January. And uh, so, you know, we did this, uh, we put a selection committee together. I also want to highlight uh, Larry Hunter, who's the next speaker, uh, was also uh, on the committee uh, and, and was part of this um, to, to pick the winners. And, you know, we, we just did it. Uh, so I think that goes back to, you know, some, th some sentiments that were expressed earlier, that sometimes the best way to make change is just to do something. Uh, we ended up giving out the first of these awards back in uh, January. So we had a junior parasite, who's on the left, couldn't say you, uh, as well as a senior parasite, Eric Turner, who's on the right. And uh, it turns out our parasites really have a sense of humor about the process. One of the things that we did uh, was give them a, uh, a leather lamprey, so a statue that has a magnetic mouth that can stick onto things, because we thought that was a lot of fun. LAUGHTER 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it turns out that Eric Turner owns a lamp <laughs> that one can stick a lamprey onto, so now we have some really bad science puns coming out of this. Um, and, and so we had a lot of fun with this, and we didn't just do it last year, so we're now doing this, we're in this for the long haul. So uh, we, we published this paper in uh, Nature Genetics earlier this year saying we're gonna do this again. Um, the call opened April 30th, do, the award nominations are due September 30th. You can find out more at our website, researchparasite.com. Uh, and if you think you might be a parasite, <laughs> you, should submit, uh, uh, you should submit an application. We'd, we'd look forward to reading it. And uh, one of the things that I've really been surprised by is, you know, I put this announcement on my website and had sort of no expectations that we would actually give out anything other than like a $30 leather lamprey. Um, <laughs> And it turns out, I guess, this editorial bothered a lot of people, because I got an email from a, a guy named Jeff Steibel who said, okay, I want to give you sort of the start of an endowment for this award so that you can do this thing in perpetuity. And uh, never uh, anything I expected to happen, but it was really amazing. And since then, um, we've gotten a, another gift from a guy named Stephen Cannon who, who, who helped out. And then uh, my wife, actually, who's amazing, <laughs> when I said, I really want to put my money where my mouth is, uh, actually said, OK. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, so I want to highlight, though, that reuse of data is not the only thing that, that plays a role here, right? The reason this works is because people share data. And going back to the letter from Newton to Hook, um, this is sort of just further down the page. So here's the giant's bit. Newton has a note here that, where he says, where are these two experiments of Hooke published? So he's actually looking for data uh, back in, in uh, 1675. And so now I really want to, this is the first time I've ever announced this. Uh, I'm announcing that we have established the Research Symbiont Awards for data sharing. <laughs> so this is an opportunity, if you're not someone who's reanalyzing data but who's generated data, to, to have an opportunity to win a prize as well. And you'll have to go to Hawaii in January to receive the award. So I know that might be disappointing to some of you, but, but this is a condition. Um, and so I've recruited uh, a physician, uh, Brian Bird, to, to lead this up. So he's, founding, he's the founding chair of this award. Um, our goal is to transform culture so that data sharing is valued as much as discoveries. And uh, we've got two awards. One is for clinical data sharing. Ideally, we're looking for trainees. So this is relatively uncommon to see trainees sharing um, data uh, that they could otherwise sort of use for many papers. And one is for any area. So if you have any area of science where you've seen impactful data sharing, please encourage people to apply. Um, we, we've been given an anonymous gift for $5,000, which will fund the first year of the award. And you can find out more on the website, researchsymbionts.com. Okay, so I just want to bring this to a close by going back to the, the quote from the beginning. So Tom Blumenthal last year said, you know, the worst thing that can be said about your grant is that it's a fishing expedition. And I love that he didn't stop there, because his follow-up was, if you engage in a fishing expedition, you can actually catch fish. <laughs> and, you know, this has been what I've seen also in my own work. Sort of every time we go fishing, it's not a struggle to find things that are undiscovered, because this is something you know, we don't usually do. As we start looking for connections between areas, we, we find these new relationships. And so this is sort of my approach to science right now. You know, I think fishing in these data is actually this easy because so few people have done it. I want to take a moment to thank the people who have contributed to this work. Um, so I have a wonderful lab that, that you know, is really interactive and, and sort of lots of uh, different work has come out of each of them and the discussions between them have really made a difference in how the science has happened. The work that I specifically talked about today was largely um, Gia Tan's work. So she's a PhD, was a PhD student in the lab. She just defended in April. So now she's Dr. Gia Tan and leaving the lab. Uh, and um, the software engineer, Kurt Wheeler, who's helping us build what we're calling a data refinery. Um, the collaborators, Deb Hogan's lab, so Georgia Dewing, Kimberly Lewis, and Jack Hammond did a lot of the molecular experiments that I showed you in Pseudomonas. Uh, investigators, so anyone who is in genomics who has actually up, gone through the trouble of uploading your data, we couldn't do any of this without you, so thank you all. And funding, so we have funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the NSF, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and some NIH funding. Um, and, you know, I think I really want to highlight the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation because when I went to the NIH and said, you know, wrote a grant and said, hey, I really want to build software for this fishing expedition, um, you know, the, the sort of, they had the, the reaction that Tom Blumenthal described of, 
you know, this is a fishing expedition, and I was like, yes, that's the whole point. That, that was the goal. <laughs> um, and they didn't view that in quite the same way that I did. Um, but then I wrote this grant for the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and it was like unambiguously a fishing expedition. They were like, great, go do it. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without their support. If you want to learn more about we, what we do, we have a website. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. It was really great. We have time for some questions. Tom, yeah. So many of us in the audience loved your talk. And in fact, we just published a paper in Molecular Cell where we parasitized data from John Wren, who is in, also in the audience. Yes. And so my question to you is, wouldn't it be even cooler to have the Parasite Award have both the Parasite and the one who has been parasited being co-winners? Yeah. So, so, yeah, so I love that. Um, so one of the things that we have been you know, thinking about doing is kind of reframing. So the parasite discussion, I think, was helpful to identify a problem. Um, and I'm not sure that framing is quite as helpful to creating a solution to that problem because it, it you know, might rub people the wrong way. So, you know, one of the things we've been thinking about is how to, re how to frame this in a way that's positive and sort of promoting a good culture as opposed to just, you know, antagonizing a culture that we don't view as maybe quite as helpful. <laughs> Thanks. So, so I have two questions. The first is easy. Did, did <laughs> yes. Longo and Drazen respond yet to your April uh, thing that you read? Um, That's the easy one. Uh, yeah. So I've had some conversations with um, you know Jeff Drazen uh, around this topic. So he invited me to the uh, New England Journal of Medicine hosted a, a data summit, and so you know I think we've had conversations. Um, around it, and I think, you know, I, I think that he probably also would like to move past the framing that they described there. I mean, he's he's emphasized that it was not his framing; he was repurposing the words of he was sort of sharing the views of others that he had heard about. Um, so, I, I yeah. So, so I have a, a real question. Since <laughs> when I first met you, I, I and when you talked uh, before, you're you're the ultimate academic scientist in every, no, I mean that as a compliment. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to let that go. But, and, and, and my question is whether you have thought about how kind of corporate biotech and pharma yeah. ought to be dealing with the thing you're doing, because everything you're saying about data, failed clinical trials, whatever they, data are, when shared openly will lead to the sort of discoveries you talked about. And it doesn't seem there's any way to make the, those people, I'm one of those people, see the, the positives as beating the negatives. That's yeah, so you know, I think one of the things that's worth remembering is that sort of data alone does not give your organization a competitive advantage, right? So having data, so there's this argument that data are the new oil. And it, it, there's, you know, so the idea is this is a scarce resource, we need to get as much of it as we can, and it'll make you inherently valuable by possessing a lot of it, particularly if other people don't possess a lot of it. Um, and so my experience has been that really the value is not the data, but the insights that you glean from it. And so your ability to kind of glean insights, I think, is actually improved by sharing your data. Because once you can say, I have these data, you have those data, now I've learned something from the combination of them, um, that, that's often much more powerful. It means that something's not just true in your experiment, it's true in general. Okay. Hi, thanks for a great talk, although I must admit I didn't understand some of it. So I, uh, maybe just the morning. Um, but one question I have for you is, uh, what, what about, let's discriminate between different types of data. Yeah. Have you given thoughts to the types of data where your techniques won't apply? as opposed to those where it will apply? Because I think one of the difficulties I have is everybody talks about the wonderful things about data. But in fact, what we need to do is distinguish what kinds of data we're talking about um, and whether they're just inherent limitations 
associated with certain types of data, whereas they may not be associated with other types of data. Yeah, so our research focus is largely on data around sort of how much of a gene, I shouldn't say, how, mu how much of, let's say, a transcript or potentially a protein product, any of these things, uh, how much of them is around in a certain cell or set of cells. Um, so these are data that are kind of reasonably well structured. I mean, we know kind of vaguely what we're measuring. Um, and that's kind of the world we've built algorithms for. Um, we have, so a student in the lab has done a little bit of work on looking at sort of clinical tests, so lab values that come out of clinical tests with the same types of methods. Um, and we think that there's value there as well, but um, you know, that's just all at an earlier stage. So, so I guess I'd say primarily for a given set of genes, if we know how much of them's around, that's really what we've looked at. And then just as a quick follow-on to that, I mean, one of the issues, of course, is the context in which data are generated. Yeah. Have you looked at how you begin to um, compare contexts, uh, not just the primary data, but the contextual data ar around that data and how it's been generated to yeah. understand the comparability of the data points? Yeah, so one of the things we're really interested in, um, which we've only kind of just started on, is can we actually infer, how much of the context can we infer directly from the data? So one of the things that I, I didn't get to mention is that we can actually figure out you know, if the canonical lab strain of Pseudomonas was used in an experiment or not, just by looking at kind of gene expression levels. And so that lets us sort of layer this, it's sort of metadata, it lets us learn something about the experiment, not by looking at what people wrote about it, but by actually looking at the data itself. Um, and so then when we have some labels, we might actually be able to describe what an investigator did directly from their experiment. That, we're really excited about it, but it's early stage, so I don't have a detailed answer. So I want to follow up the, the first of the questions that you just asked, and I was struck by the fact that you add noise to the data. Yeah. And, and I, I think this is something called stochastic resonance. Is that the right uh, term for this? Uh, so there's a lot of different yeah. um, names for this. Um, in this case, you know, it's called, they, the technical term is masking noise, but basically, you know, what we, one of the things we do when we build any of these algorithms is we try to add random, just add random data to the system and make sure things don't break. Uh, because, you know, you could imagine when you're looking at all public data that people just upload whatever and some of it might be nonsense. And so what we want to make sure is like if there's nonsense in there, it doesn't fall apart. Yeah. So the reason why I'm asking that, to dig one level deeper, yes. you're using expression data. Yes. Which is famously noisy and differs from platform to platform and lab to lab and day to day and so on. And I would have thought initially that that would be hurting you but maybe it's actually helping you. So the, my real question is, how do you know how much noise? There's obviously an optimum for the noise level in the data which lets all this work. Yeah. And how do you know, is that known or is that something you have to guess at? So one thing we can do is sort of ask where the models fall apart. So one of the things that we can see is that if we, as long as we add kind of 10% of the sort of genes randomly perturbed, um, the model tends to be real, reasonably robust. We can actually go up to like 70 or 80% of the genes sort of masked. Um, and the models still remain somewhat robust at that stage, but they become extremely difficult to interpret. So you can imagine, this is a neural network, so you know, what you really want are sort of pathways or these things kind of aggregating into one or two nodes so you can find them again. If you go to these really high levels of noise, the model theoretically works, but like the network is so interconnected that it's uninterpretable. So I guess I'd say the bounds in which we can understand the network are much smaller than the bounds where it works, and we have some handle on that, but. And what about the brain? Oh, what was that? I mean, does, does our brain profit from a certain level of noise? I suspect it probably does. Is that known? Yeah. Does anybody know? I I'm think? sure someone else in the audience <laughs> is much better suited to answering that question than I am. <laughs> now that it got here, I, I forgot what my question is. Okay. Uh, um, on your data, um, what public data sets are you using? Are you just using those associated with human research? Or are you adding in, say, um, animal and, and other public data sets? Yeah, so at the moment, um, the way we're doing this is we're downloading all public data for one organism, and we're looking within that organism. So for humans, we'd be looking within humans. For mice, we're looking within mice. For pseudomonas, we're looking within pseudomonas. You know, our next step is you know, regulation is related in all these organisms, and so we'd like to, there's techniques from a domain called transfer learning, where you can take a model and sort of move it and retrain it. Um, we're very interested in that. It's 
I don't have anyone working on it, so if anyone else wants to work on it, you should absolutely take that project and run with it, because I would love to know what the answer is, but it should be possible, we just haven't done it. And did you do a podcast about a year ago on this paper with, where you were explaining how it worked, this <laughs> signal to noise? Yeah, so uh, I, wasn't I think it would actually be nice for people to know how to get that podcast because it was very informative. Okay, yeah, so it wasn't a podcast, but it was um, the journal actually asked us, to, they were like, this is kind of a crazy idea. Can you do like a quick video that explains what you're trying to do here? So, yeah, so we, I, yeah, I'll put a link to that. Um, I'll tweet a link to that after this. Okay, I'm going to thank you very much and, and stop the questions here. Thank so you. We can stay on time. Thank you. Great talk.